First of all, I provide outreach in two areas for the University of Kentucky. One is on climate change and another, well, outreach in many areas, but one, two controversial areas. One is climate change and the second is genetic engineering of crops. And um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know that I'm a glutton for punishment, but it sometimes feels that way. And, uh, and uh, so, um, and okay. so I, I do the two areas of outreach, uh, climate change on the left and genetically engineered crops on the right. It's advanced. And um, so this is a marvelous slide of why climate change is an issue. It speaks very strongly to us in extension because we're, we're very respectful of scientific data, but it, it, in my experience and the research shows, it doesn't really matter much when you get into this controversial area. So some useful approaches, let's advance. What Martha has said, I, I really want to emphasize that I've learned through hard knocks, basically. One, we have to speak to values. Now, we, we have to speak in ways that are supported by research, but we have to speak to values and not show, not overdo the data. Two, uh, sometimes there's a matter of using trusted messengers uh, that particular worldviews will listen to. The third is the use of high-impact images, which I'll show examples of. And four is to find a way to make it personal. Okay. So advance to the next slide. And let me give you some examples. Now, everything from here on out, I'm basically going to be saying what I might say to a, an audience. And so maybe sometimes I'll be speaking to you directly. But find uh, the state of Kentucky on this map. And you can see with your own eyes that, that, uh, that, that things have changed. Climate has changed in Kentucky. And, and every uh, gr grower in Kentucky over 50 knows that climate has changed. So that, that's one way to make this real to um, producers. Let's go to the next slide. And this slide basically screams stewardship. So connecting to those values that Martha met and mentioned. And so, um, you know, if, if farmers do care about taking care of the land, and, and, uh, and so when they understand that this is a stewardship issue, I think it speaks more strongly to them. Advance. Now, here's another fact that I think growers are always glad to hear. If you look at the, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, you find that agriculture is not number one, it's not number two, it's not number three, it's actually pretty far down at number four, pretty close to commercial and residential emissions. And so growers, I like to tell growers, look, it's not your fault. And that softens their, their, their resistance to this topic. So they don't feel so blamed for it. Next slide. So th this is a wonderful, again, example of why I think growers, you know, it helps them to understand they're not to blame. And, um, and so if you look at the greenhouse gas emissions from uh, the dairy, uh, dairy production per cow, it, you see that 1944 is much lower than, than uh, recent times. And so that kind of looks like, you know, th that's not speaking very well about the uh, emissions due to agriculture. But if you advance, you should see the, the results for, uh, for greenhouse gas emissions, not per cow, but per kilogram of milk which is really what we care about. It's the kilogram of milk or the kilogram of meat. That's what we buy and that's what we eat. And there, by that matter, because of all the efficiencies, yes, there's high greenhouse gas emissions per cow, but there's so much more milk being produced that actually the greenhouse gas emissions are less per unit of, of production. And so it, it, growers have done a great job of reducing the, the carbon footprint based on that measure. And I think it's really important to, to, for growers to understand that. And, uh, and so they're more receptive to talk to discussions about climate change if we, we start with these things. Okay, next slide shows um, an example, several examples, including this one, of, of how growers actually are already doing things to reduce uh, global warming, or, or what, maybe we would avoid that word, but climate change. Um, and, and so anything they're doing, cover crops or no-till to uh, build up soil organic matter, uh, is is capturing carbon, as you all know, and uh, cleans the atmosphere. So I like to point out that they're already doing things that help this this issue. Another example on the next slide, if they're using precision ag technologies and getting more and more efficient at their production, use, using resources more and more wisely, that uh, is reducing the carbon footprint of agriculture on a per, per, per unit production basis. They're using cover crops. This has got many benefits. Uh, and it also is a way to reduce the carbon footprint uh, of agriculture on a per unit of production basis. So they're already doing lots of things. Next slide. 
Now, when they buy seeds, um, you know, the, the, the seed companies, and I tell them this, I say they're all breeding for heat and drought tolerance. They're all doing this. And they don't talk about climate change. They don't talk about global warming because they know it frustrates some customers. They don't want to lose customers. But they, this is what they're doing. They're breeding for global warming, and they know it. And they want to be in a position to sell you seed that is adapted to the changing conditions. So this, this seems to get through, I think, sometimes to growers, too, when they realize that this is all going on. And they're actually kind of glad to hear that people are breeding for heat and drought tolerance. Next slide. If a grower does uh, work to uh, pay attention to soil erosion in any way, shape, or form, that is helping to adapt to climate change because we know we're going to uh, very likely, based on the research that we see, we're going to get more severe rainfall uh, episodes periodically. And so there's more reason to pay attention to soil er erosion in now and in the future than ever before. And then conversely, uh, drought, I've already talked about that, and more adaptation to drought is uh, the other extreme that we can expect um, for agriculture. And so next slide, we can see that uh, growers in Western Kentucky, many of them are putting in irrigation systems. They may or may not use the words climate change, but what they are doing is they're adapting their farm to these changing conditions that we, we understand to be due uh, largely to greenhouse gases. Next slide. So again, I, I'm not showing data slides, okay? And so I think that's that's important. I think it's very important to be very data-based, but if if we want to connect with these audiences we're on these topics, it's it's important to speak to values, as Martha made so clear. So let me give you some examples from the genetic engineering uh, realm. So uh, we'll switch from this slide of corn to the this glyphosate tolerant corn picture. And um, so anybody in agriculture who works with grain farmers knows that by and large herbicide tolerance has been very popular for good reasons among farmers. So uh, that that's important to recognize that. But, um, but uh, let's go to the next slide. If we're going to be credible on this very controversial topic, we really have to make sure that we recognize the legitimate pros and cons of the picture beyond just uh, the uh, issue of, of, uh, of um, you know, how it affects production. And so Monsanto uh, has, you know, they took advantage of a marketing uh, opportunity. I don't, I don't blame them at all for that, but they have uh, bought up a lot of seed companies with the profits that they've gotten from genetic engineering. And that's the American way, but you can see that they've grown. And so a, a lot of people, including some good friends of mine, are concerned about this uh, so sort of consolidation of the seed industry among principally uh, just a few major companies with Monsanto leading the way. So that, you know, I just recognize that. I say, yeah, I understand. That's a concern that, that you have. Next slide. Um, anybody who pays attention knows that glyphosate resistant weeds are also a problem uh, from, uh, w with respect to this particular application of genetic engineering. We've got to acknowledge that. Growers know it. They're dealing with it. It's not a pleasant situation, but it's a reality. Next slide. Now, um, here is something, uh, this is from the World Health Organization back in March. They uh, considered, they made a judgment, a uh, scientific judgment, that glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is a probable humor carcinogen. Um, now, not all regulatory agencies agree with that assessment, but as soon as they did, then I put that into my extension program. You got to make it part because we don't, you know, we just have to provide the full picture when we do our extension programs. Now, again, the European Food Safety Administration just categorically rejects that characterization. So I, I now point that out too. But, um, but we can't we can't ignore the fact that this is uh, important information. So uh, you know, on the safety issue, next slide. You should see my family, and and you know we could we could give uh, you, I can give a whole graduate course on the research on safety, but this kind of says it for me. It, it's, you know, I feed it to my family. I have no concerns about my family eating genetically engineered crops because I know the science very well. Um, and, and again, this picture probably speaks much more loudly than data slides. Next slide. So, um, but to really make this point they're, they're, uh, on safety, here's a few, here are a few slides that might, that I like to show um, to, to create cognitive dissonance, which means to make it not so clear anymore what what is the the path here you know because there are pros and cons 
And so this, if you're familiar with BT corn, you know that it protects against insect injury to the kernels, at least mo most of the BT genetically engineered traits. And so the, the, the wounding from insects can lead to mold colonization. And so the one on the left is not only moldy, but it can also have mycotoxins, which are natural toxins, which are not good. The so next slide. So fumonisins are common mycotoxins. Fortunately, they don't occur widely most years, but they certainly are important in many parts of the world, including Kentucky. And um, natural toxins next advance, and you should see you should see uh, birth defects that are uh, increased in populations that consume corn contaminated with fumonisins. So particularly, I'm talking about Central America and Africa. So uh, so. You know, I, I actually think that uh, the use of genetic engineering in this case makes the corn, makes the crop safer to consume. I think it's well established. If we advance and you see this is also true for aflatoxins, which also occur in corn throughout the world. Um, and uh, how do you, uh, and, and aflatoxins, why do we care? Because they're very potent uh, liver uh, carcinogens. And so I, I actually am very much in favor of the use of BT for this reason, and other reasons, I should say. But using it wisely, of course. Now, the next slide shows you um, a couple of other examples, to, again, to create some cognitive dissonance among those who who, um, who think it's all about Monsanto and, uh, uh, and Roundup Ready. It, it, it's not. Um, these purple tomatoes actually are shown to uh, reduce the incidence of cancer in laboratory mice. I'm telling you, I want this. I want these tomatoes. I want them. I'd like to see them commercialized. I hope they are. Next slide. Um, here's a, here's a product that is a product line that is moving through regulatory channels. And uh, not only do you see less bruising from this genetically engineered potato, but you also have 50 to 70 percent less acrylamide. And acrylamide is a natural, hu probable human carcinogen. Um, and I, I, again, I want these potatoes. I'm glad to eat these potatoes. I'd, I'd rather eat them than something that has higher acrylamide uh, content in, in the French fried potatoes. But it's not in the raw potato, in the fried potato. Next slide. So again, uh, this, is a, this is to really solidify this point that this is not all about Monsanto uh, and not all about Roundup Ready, even though that's what most people will think of. But we really, you know, we have to put that aside if we're really going to explore and understand the issue at a little bit more depth. Next slide. And and this is um, a, a very good example of, of uh, to again to make to really blow open the issue in a good way so that people understand the complexity uh, of of the issue and understand that it's not all about uh, Roundup Ready uh, corn. So here we have uh, bacterial wilted banana. And that's the cut stem of a banana, and you can see just the billions of bacterial cells pouring out of the water conducting tissue. So logically, you're going to see blight and wilt. And um, and so in advance to, to show those, and advance to show the uh, African woman holding the rotted bananas. So the rotted bananas, that's, that's due to infection by the bacterium. So it isn't just the wilt of the plant, it's also the loss of the harvested uh, fruit. And this affects uh, roughly 100 million people in Eastern Africa. This is a very serious, very serious problem. And, and, uh, and the only solution that any scientist in the world has come up with is, let's advance, is a genetically engineered solution. And it is a single gene, uh, one of two, uh, both of them work, that has, comes from pepper, and it's in, uh, engineered into banana. And, uh, and it provides the control that you see in this field trial. So, so again, it, 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 it's a way of speaking to values. It's a way if, of pointing out that, look, this, these are African scientists addressing an African problem that affects African people and has the full support of African government. So it's, it's really, it's really, if we really care about food sovereignty and choice we, and freedom from dependence, we, we, uh, we have to recognize that this is, is something that's way different from the application for herbicide tolerance.